When I first sat down to draft this video, there were a lot of things that rattled around in my head. If you gave me a topic in the game, I could go on about what's not working and how it could be fixed for quite a while. The problem I keep running into is that, because of the nature of simulation games, I would inevitably drift from topic to topic, chasing related issues through a huge network of poorly considered or entirely broken gameplay loops. And that is the essential problem I have when discussing Elite Dangerous right now. It's not that the whole game sucks. Elite Dangerous is a game filled with good ideas that are being severely gimped by some specific bad decisions. In this, my first video in what I hope will be a series, I want to focus on what I believe is the most important current problem that can be readily addressed. I want to present these issues in a ready format that identifies the specific problem, explains that problem from a current gamer's perspective, and then suggest solutions that could address the issue. I make these suggestions expecting nothing from the developer. I just want to make them available for the record as a longtime player, who is engaged with Odyssey and Horizons in good faith, attempting to play both games as intended and as practical, in order to gain the appropriate perspective. My suggestions are made as if both Odyssey and Horizons are one game, as this is the eventual intention. When people think about grind in a video game, they don't often consider monetary value, economic transactions, or the psychology of sunk costs. Grind is a negative descriptor of the amount of effort that a game requires in order to offer its players a reward. When players use the word grind, it's always negative, and game designers across the industry don't seem to understand just how bad a word it actually is. For comparison, Look back at some of the great successes in gaming history. Skyrim, Bioshock, Mass Effect, The Witcher series are all past games that share ground with Elite Dangerous. All of these games are open worlds of varying scale, they all have role-playing elements deeply ingrained into the player's motivation, and they all have long play lengths. None of them, in any conversation I've had, can be described as grindy. The first thing one has to understand about grind is that when a player describes a part of your game as being grindy, they're fundamentally saying that the reward they are receiving is not proportional to the work required to attain it. If this were an employee, what they would be asking for is a raise, and if you fail to provide it, they'll feel inclined to start looking for more rewards somewhere else, potentially with a competitor. This is why I have elected to connect the grind in Elite Dangerous to its economy. They are ultimately so interconnected as to be inseparable from one another. Fixing one will fix the others. And this is the part where I could break down several different topical branches, because a game's economy touches on basically any transaction in which the player engages. This process becomes more complicated the more interdependent these systems become. Skyrim, for example, is possessed of a low overall interdependence as economies are concerned. Within it, there are a series of economic systems that a player can engage with, only three of which are considered mandatory. These are gold, which functions as the fundamental transactional currency for goods, experience, which controls access to player abilities and character attributes, and dragon souls, which unlock special high-powered abilities. These three currencies are the predominant ones, and the only ones which a player cannot help but earn as they progress through the game, though a player can optimize their activity to focus on any one of them if they want to. In addition to its mandatory currencies, Skyrim also possesses a series of optional ones, connected to specific gameplay loops, where optional is defined as the player not being required to earn them, or engage with their related gameplay loops in order to complete the game. These include, but are not limited to, alchemy, in which the player must collect various ingredients and brew them to make useful potions or poisons, magicka, in which the player must collect spellbooks and read them to amass a collection of usable spells, enchantment, in which the player must collect special weapons and analyze them in order to earn or learn the enchantment attached. Souls, 
in which the player must hunt NPCs of varying types to collect energy to make or recharge an enchanted weapon. All of these currencies are collected and expended exactly as if they had been money. We just use different names for what is ultimately an economic transaction. The player is still giving something in order to get something. A player who wishes to focus on swordplay in Skyrim need not engage with alchemy, magicka, enchantment, or souls. Likewise, a player focused on magicka need never touch an enchanted weapon. They are not concerned with the currencies of loops they don't engage with. Should the player encounter them, they're able to exchange these optional currencies for gold, the fundamental currency. In addition to being able to sell these items, players are also granted opportunities to purchase the final product of any one of these loops at markets in exchange for gold, though often at exorbitant premiums. This simple foundational system is what controls and evaluates the time-reward ratio in Skyrim. All items in Skyrim are valued in gold, and so gold acts as an indicator of the time and effort required to generate an item in the game world. This makes the acquisition of gold a critical component of the game, as it is, effectively, a representation of the total effort expended into the game. Effort can be exchanged around to avoid playing parts of the game that a player doesn't like or finds boring. A combat-focused player may, for example, spend gold accrued bounty hunting to purchase enchanted armor rather than taking the time to hunt down the appropriate enchantment and souls required to make it themselves. In effect, the player is exchanging a reward earned doing something they like in Skyrim to avoid doing something they don't enjoy. This is the single significant gotcha currently plaguing Elite Dangerous, and the single factor taking an otherwise fun game and making it into a chore. One so prolific and miserable, it is actively chasing people like me away from the experience here and into competing products like Star Citizen. Elite Dangerous makes you do things you don't like in order to get the things you need, in order to be effective at the things you do like. Elite Dangerous in its current form offers two mandatory currencies. Credits, the fundamental transactional currency, essentially identical to gold in Skyrim, and arcs, the cosmetic currency, which we're not too concerned with in this video. Elite Dangerous has only two optional currencies, engineering materials, used to construct various blueprints, and faction status, used to earn ships, system permits, and other less important things. Remember that an optional currency is any currency which the player is not required to earn through the course of gameplay. Credits and experience happen any time the player completes nearly any task, where engineering and faction status are only required on completion of specific tasks in specific locations. Players can elect to ignore the engineering system altogether, though they do so at an extreme disadvantage compared to players who do engage with the system. As with Skyrim, you have players who prefer specific loops within Elite Dangerous. Some players prefer exploration, others trading, and others combat. Each loop has subgroups and specialities, but they are all affected by the need to collect engineering materials, and will need to collect a multitude of them in order to bring their ship up to its maximum potential though many of these loops are readily doable without any engineering whatsoever. This is the first major dissonance, and one of the most important. The whole idea behind an optional currency is that players can willfully ignore it because alternatives exist that enable them to become effective. Skyrim is ultimately a combat-focused dungeon crawler, so the variety comes down to how you want to kill targets, and not whether or not you want to. However, the principle remains true, and whichever preference or strategy you select, there are ways that you can be stunningly effective. Elite Dangerous, however, does not offer any alternative to the engineering system, and as a result have created an optional currency that behaves more like a mandatory one, while still maintaining the attitude of an optional currency. You don't have to engineer your ship, but refusing to do so means accepting a permanent state of extreme disadvantage compared to players who do. Many of these engineering materials require players to engage in very tedious, repetitive tasks that are not fun and are not what the player wants to do, 
in order to get to the things that they do want to do. Players are often required by the nature of the activities involved in engineering to work alone, as this is nearly always the most effective way to do the work. What has been created here is a game that purports to be an MMORPG, where players are often disincentivized or disadvantaged by playing together while working on the engineering systems, which in turn means that players seeking engineering opportunities most often play alone, not because they want to, but because playing alone makes the grind less intense. Skyrim's economy, while primitive, still enabled players to focus on playing the game the way they enjoyed it, where Elite Dangerous, packing a far more complex and dynamic economic model, offers no practical method to accomplish this. In addition, many of the economic models surrounding the engineering system defy the logic of a normal functional economy for no other discernible reason than to increase the amount of effort required to progress through the system. So how do you fix the problem? Put simply, Elite Dangerous needs to implement an economic model where engineering materials, both in Horizons and Odyssey, can be purchased or sold for credits. We need a model by which these materials participate in the game's normal economic exchanges and are made more or less available by economic conditions throughout the game. While full economic integration may not be a short-term goal, Elite Dangerous already possesses the ability to leverage in-game systems to allow materials to become readily tradable. In Horizons, this can be done through the Materials Trader, and in Odyssey, this can be done through the Bartender, especially since the game already evaluates every engineering material in credits by way of the Mission Rewards system and Bartender sales screen. In the short term, Frontier can greatly reduce applicable grind by modifying the Bartender and Material Trader to accept credits in exchange for the desired material using the valuation models already in the game. In the long term, these systems can be modified to account for supply and demand, enabling both trader and bartender to offer dynamic inventories that shift with changes in the market, especially for bottleneck items like power regulators, which are one of the least logical items to acquire in the Odyssey model. At the time of writing, power regulators are not available for purchase at any price, anywhere in the game while simultaneously being a common part which plays a role in every type of vehicle in the game, since they can be salvaged from wrecked SRVs or ships. Being as abundant as the game implies them to be, and being a critical component in multiple systems, it would make sense for this item, in particular, to be a commodity rather than a material, and be something readily available at any station market. In addition to ready availability, the presence of degraded power regulators suggests that these parts suffer wear and tear, which means that there is a constant need for replacements, and therefore a need for any facility dependent on them to maintain a stock of ready replacements for reactors, vehicles, and ships. A stock that should at least be accessible by players to steal. But in the current implementation, every settlement contains only one and is totally screwed if it's ever stolen. That the only current way to acquire them is via salvage RNG, or by stealing them from a settlement, typically by murdering several of the occupants, is a failure of game design, and one which feels deliberately calculated to raise the cost of progression. Given later suit blueprints require as many as 10 of these items to furnish a single step up the engineering rank, the presence of this mechanic and its related frustrations are one of the main reasons I am not enjoying Odyssey. Power regulators are not the only offender here either. Opinion polls and the varying blueprints for suits, weapons, and ships have proven equally frustrating since they can only be acquired through varying forms of theft, or extremely rarely as a mission reward. One key element of managing grind and ensuring players can enjoy their experience is the ability to assess a specific time or effort value to the completion of a goal or task. Players can determine, without too much effort, how long it will take them to earn the credits to buy an outfit in Anaconda, performing a given activity they enjoy. 
What they cannot predict is the amount of time it will take to locate and collect the engineering materials they need in order to fully upgrade their selected modules, since many of the key ingredients are available only through random chance. Random number mechanics can help with procedural generation and are a useful tool for aggregating some kinds of loot, but Elite Dangerous has become over-reliant on them to such a degree that it is impossible to accurately estimate how much time it will take to collect all the items that you need for a given engineering blueprint, making it difficult to justify attempting the activity and demoralizing when hours are spent playing in good faith and zero progress is made toward the thing you want. I have never played a game more stingy with its reward structures than this one is. Of course, there will need to be some fine-tuning of blueprints and ingredients to make everything feel well-synchronized. The fine details here are something that could only happen internal to Frontier. Using credits as the central grind would certainly enable players to play exactly how they want, and would greatly resolve a lot of the grind pressure that Odyssey has induced. It is not, however, the only solution. The following could be implemented individually or as part of a centralized credit market. Salvage Scanner. This could be implemented as a ship module and be an added function for the scanner that players already carry in their suits. While in a ship, the Salvage Scanner module enables players to scan a settlement for instances of a target material and then provides feedback as to the general area the item they're looking for may be located. When on the ground, Players can use their suit scan tool to refine the item's position down to a specific container or NPC and act accordingly. From a mechanical perspective, this tool would point the way to a guaranteed role of the item that a player is looking for. Individual transactions. Enable players to purchase or sell engineering materials to one another for credits or other materials. Operating on the same functional ground as the trading system in games like Rocket League, fleet carriers could act as passive points of sale, allowing players to facilitate transactions while not actively logged in. This would not solve the fundamental grind issue, but it would enable players to build their own workarounds while creating opportunities for emergent gameplay. This solution could also work in combination with a central credit market. Blueprint Cost Reductions Pare down the need for bottleneck items to one or two per blueprint, for things like power regulators and opinion polls. Item Effort Multiplier. Enable multiple instances of an item to be deposited to inventory per collection event, the same way engineering materials on ships work. Individual Item Storage. Adapt the Horizons model for storing ship engineering materials to the Odyssey system giving players the ability to collect a large amount of the individual materials they might need, rather than being forced to share a central 1,000-unit pool. Any of these solutions would represent an improvement, and an urgently needed one if Odyssey is to regain its position in the market and the reputation of its player base. These solutions would all reduce the amount of playtime required to fully engineer a suit, but would make that playtime much more enjoyable. If players like the gameplay, they will engage more often and, as they've done with ships, branch out to engineer and specialize, experiment and develop additional suits more tailored to their desired gameplay style. If there's one thing Odyssey needs more than any other, it is to have respect for the player's time. These suggestions represent the first and most important change that needs attention. And it's my hope that, at some point in the near future, the grind problem gets attention as the first priority. If it doesn't, I fear that Elite Dangerous competitors will gain a permanent upper hand, and in the midst of the rapidly reddening ocean of space sims, it won't be able to reclaim the position it once had. All the foundations and good ideas necessary for Elite Dangerous to succeed are already in the game. The best thing that can be done now is remove barriers to the activities that players want to play. It's my hope that these suggestions are well received, if they are received at all. Thanks for your time and your views. I'll catch you all later.